Rachel, I forgot this was recording. Hello. Oh, yeah. Welcome to Marxism Today. I'm Red Wagner, joined by Tony Schmidt. And today we're going to talk about uh, a new book. Well, new ish. I mean, compared to Marx's Capital, it's very (laughs) good. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. I think it was published last year in France, this year in the United States with the English version. And it is Thomas Piketty. I think that's how we decided we're going to pronounce it, or somewhere yeah, around we, there. We look. I'm going to be honest. We we've, we've done a lot of arguing and looking up of the the pronunciation of the author's name. Yeah. It, yeah. Because I, I took French in high school, which is a long time ago, admittedly. But I I feel like when I looked at it, it w- was supposed to be pronounced Thomas Piketty. But I don't feel like saying that, so I think I'm going to say it wrong. I yeah. mean, we could, we could, I feel like, let's just say, we're going to say his name how we feel like saying his name, and I think we're both going to say it different ways, but we'll both understand each other, because I think when I say it, like, just with my regular accent, I'm going to say Piketty. It just feels right to me to say Piketty. I know that's not <laughs> anywhere near what he says. And yeah. I think you you you're actually much closer. You say like uh, Piketty. Piketty. Is that what? Yeah. yeah. Now that we've Which, said the other way, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Piketty, I think, is actually much closer. Maybe that's what I should say. Maybe I'll say it that way. I don't know. You know, if I'm, he could have come and sat down with us. He obviously did not care uh, with our invitation that we never sent out. No, yeah. Because if he would be here, then I would feel bad and make sure I got it right. I also probably would just call him. Toma, or whatever you said. I yeah. probably just call him Tommy. Yeah, there is no S sound in the, which is normal for French. You gotta like leave off the last couple of letters. Really? Yeah. Hmm. They're just there for show, my friend. You don't pronounce the last letter usually. Oh, so I'd be Tony, or no, Tone, Tone. I guess people do call me Tone sometimes. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway. Yeah. You see now with your last name, they could say Schmidt. But only because there's two T's. They'd probably even put an E at the end just to be safe. An E and an S? No, not the S. But if there were multiple of you, then it would be Schmidt, but with an E-S at the end. But it would sound the same. Uh, I took (laughs) Spanish. And uh, hablo muy mal. So, you know, that's, that's important. Anyway. Did we even say the name of his book, Capital no. in the 21st Century? Yeah, Capital in the 21st Century, which I realized, because the, the, I said it was recent compared to Marx's Capital, this is actually a very similar title. Instead of Capital, it's um, Capital in, in the 21st Century. Yeah, which I think was very, very purposeful on his part, is to invoke Marx while being, is, is sort of a, like a getting people's attention. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes the book sound like it's going to be a modern-day Marxist classic. Yeah, which it is not. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, to give an over, uh, a brief overview yeah, now, of the now book... Yeah, we got to get into it. So after we start bashing it, we got to start saying yeah. why we're bashing it. Yeah, a well, brief overview of the book. <clears throat> Thomas Piketty is talking about... Not capital. He's talking about wealth. Um, he says so in the opening bits that he's talking about wealth and not ca- or and using the word capital interchangeably with it, which is wrong. Capital is a process of accumulation of wealth. So anything used in that process is capital, and wealth is just money. Like a dollar sitting on the the table is just money. It's wealth. But if that dollar is picked up and then used in a manner in which to make more money from that dollar, then it's capital. I think is a pretty quick and dirty definition of the difference. Yeah. And 
I think that's important to keep in mind with Piketty's book, because he's, I don't know, it personally irritated me a lot that he did that. And he's not talking a ton about the 21st century, Mm -hmm. so I personally like the title Wealth in the 18th, or, yeah, late 18th, 19th, 20th, and early 21st century, I think is a much, much closer to it, and maybe, and its inequalities. Because uh-huh. that is, he's not analyzing, he's mostly analyzing inequality and flow of wealth in country to country from top centiles and the lower and mid centiles of those distri- wealth distributions. Now, it, let me ask you this. And this is going to become clear very quickly as we talk about this. So I, I should just say this up front. Tony has read the book. I have not. So I, I'm kind of playing playing dummy on this one or, or being the interviewer and Tony can be the reviewer. But it, isn't it true that it, in, at some point in the book he taught, like, or a major part of his argument is based upon the rate of return upon capital? Is that correct? I didn't actually think it seemed like a major part of his overall analysis. I mean, it was in there, I think, for... And I mean, again, I'm just venturing in on my economics education, so I could be wrong. I didn't... I guess it is central to sort of what he's talking about, because he's talking about inequality and accumulation. Well, so, okay, I lied. Yes, I would say that it <laughs> isn't... Uh, a good bit of it. I mean, it's a... He doesn't beat you over the head with it like he does some other things. So, it... It's central to the argument, but... I don't know. I wouldn't say it's necessarily super present in there. I guess. Although, also, I should mention with this book, I personally found it to be long-winded. Unnecessary, very unnecessarily un- long-winded. This comes from the guy who read Capital Volumes 1 and 2. Yeah. Um, there was a lot in there. I I honestly think a decent editor could have sheared it down to about 200 pages, probably. Really? Without destroying how much, it. How big is it? Um, I think if you leave out the notes section at the end, it was like 600 pages about. Just wow. shy of, I think. So you think it could be a could have been the third of the size? Yes, it easily could have been a third of the size. You know what, actually? I'm, I'm acting surprised, but I that really doesn't surprise me. I think that's actually the case with far too many books. Yeah. Like, someone writes a pretty good long-length article, and then they think, oh, I could make this into a book, and then they basically do. Yeah. You could say the length is justified depending on the depth of background you want because a lot of this more of it comes from him jumping back in time to talk about you know oh the his, here's the historical thing for that or let's talk about instead of ta- just giving he's really trying to justify his stuff more mm. it's more about yeah trying to make it so that people don't argue with it than it is about presenting what actually needs to be presented Sure, so it's it's like a little bit of thesis or theory, but then lots of backup. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, which, I don't know. I think, since he's obviously also writing it for a non-specialist audience, mm-hmm. um, I think you could have cut that bit out. Because if you're writing it for, you know, if he's trying to turn this into, like, a big academic thing, I mean, obviously, for that, you need to fully justify everything you do. But I don't, I don't think for the way it was written, he needed to justify it like that. So the structure of the book is he starts out about income and capital, which to me was boring. <laughs> I mean, most, I I didn't enjoy the book terribly and, and, much. And tell me, l- let me let me just ask this question: What? It, yeah, maybe maybe we should start with what was your overall reaction to the book? It was long-winded. He was a bit arrogant sounding at some points. He is a man who I think he wants to be the next uh, John Maynard Keynes. Mm -hmm. That is what, and I mean, based upon the reaction he's gotten in America, is very much, I think, what some other people want as well. Because 
he is going. They want him to be. Yeah, because like Keynes went. Oh, look, we'll ignore the fact that this has been pointed out before, but there are problems in capitalism, mm-hmm. and I have a way to fix them. Even though there again have been answers for this before, but he's basically doing the same thing, but this time talking about inequality as opposed to crises. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So. Yeah. Which, I mean, inequality obviously could, can lead to crises, but <clears throat> he's not really. I don't even know if he, tu- I think he might touch on it briefly in one spot, but then I think he dismissed it pretty quickly, if I remember. So what are, you, you've already mentioned a few, but I, I want to ask, what are your biggest beefs with the book? Like, where does the book really <laughs> annoy you? Well, the one is the the length and the unnecessary going, or what I consider unnecessarily going back. Mm-hmm. Um, my biggest beef is with him using the word capital instead of wealth. I think it's somewhat purposefully deceptive. Oh, well, go unpack that a little bit. What's that mean? Well, he knows the difference between capital and wealth. He says so. On, I don't know what page, not terribly far into the book, I think in the introduction, Mm -hmm. or in the very first part when he's talking about income and capital, he says most people define capital as, as I said before, the process of accumulation of uh, capital. Um, But he basically says he's counting everything. He's counting wealth. He says he will use capital and wealth interchangeably. But... I want to kind of challenge you on that a little bit. Can you... I guess we can may probably think of some counterexamples. But don't you think it's the case that a concentration of wealth that is equal to multi-millions of dollars is probably cap, mostly capital? Oh yeah, a large bit of it is capital, but not all of it is. And he's taken into account parts of it that aren't capital as well. Like he's not just talking about the parts that are working actively to accumulate value. He's talking about just money that's sitting there as well. But if I think of... Okay, so so let's get into the forms of wealth that are not capital. That's like the value of all the stuff I own Mm -hmm. and like the value of your home if you own one. Yeah, and we're talking about the rich. We're talking about owning a lot of homes. But not that many compared to the amount of wealth they have, right? Like, if you took my the if you took a graph of someone's w- amount of homes versus their wealth, like it's not a straight line, right? Like, right. if I made ten times as much as I make, I wouldn't own ten times as many homes. Yeah. Like, I would own more homes. Like, I would probably have like a cabin and I don't know whatever. Like, I. Like, people own more homes as they get more wealthy, but I think it becomes a smaller and smaller percentage of their overall wealth, right? Yeah, probably. Depending on how ridiculous the homes are. (laughs) I guess my my question is, does it throw it off a lot? Do you think there's a lot of wealth out there that isn't capital? I mean, there's obviously some. I don't know what the disparity is, but the part where it annoys me for this book is I think it's fine for his main argument, his main thread, because it doesn't make a difference, because he's talking about inequality. And inequality, you know, goes with wealth and capital, both just fine. But it's where he decides to try and bash Marx, and Marx's falling rate of the profit of capital over time, Mm -hmm. where he says, oh, look, it stays about the same over time. There isn't a declining rate. Uh... Whereas I, and I went and looked up last night and found this paper, so we'll have to put a link to it. Um, somebody did, using his data, showed that no, it does actually decline over time because he's equating wealth and capital when they're not exactly the same. So that is, I think that's more where it does that. I took it a little personally when he decided to randomly bash marks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's why that one's such a pet peeve for me. Because for the overall, if you ignore that part of the book, I don't think it make or the part where he bashes Marx, I don't think it makes a difference for his book. I think it's just a little annoying then. Once I was able to get past that part, I found it just mildly irritating. 
Well, so so let me let me think this through in my head here. Uh, if so, Piketty's stance and and what he proves is that the income generated by wealth remains constant over time. No, that the the rate of profit by capital remains constant over time. But capital defined uh, by wealth. Yeah. And you're saying that there there's another person who has proved that if you restrict it only to capital, that the value declines over time. Correct. Um, now, is when we restrict it only to capital, we're probably excluding financial capital. Is that correct? No, he's talking about all capital. Or I, I, he, his data includes that. So if they're using the same data, they're not restricting that. So I don't. How can you? How can those be different? Why? Why would those diverge? And this is where my lack of economics is not going to be exactly great, and why we will include the link. Okay. Because there's a paper here. I just brought it up by Esteban. Ezequiel Mateo of the University in Buenos Aires in Argentina. This is a guy who wrote, his paper is called Piketty against Piketty, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall in the United Kingdom in Germany since 19th century confirmed by Piketty's data. So, that's the paper. And I will not lie. I have to read through it a lot more and a lot more carefully to really understand all of it, because that is one of those areas where my knowledge of Marx and economics is not very strong with this. See, this gets into a whole Marxist debate that I have never invested very much in, one way or the other. Yeah, me which, either. <laughs> yeah, which is the whole declining rate of profit theory or falling rate of profit theory. And, uh, you know, I think it's very easy to be, you know, the, people will probably hate me by, for saying this. I'm probably going to make some enemies, but I'm going to say it anyway. The, I think it's very easy to be a Marxist whether the rate of profit is falling or not. Like, the general principle that there is surplus value that is created by people that is controlled by a small minority um, who, who didn't solely create it, that, that I think is the central issue in Marxism. Like, if there's a moral stance in Marxism, there it is, right there. And that holds true whether or not, whether the like rate of that surplus value is very high or very low or or anywhere in between like it really doesn't matter how much it is the the issue is that somebody is you know that that the there's a a huge difference here between the amount that someone contributes and the amount that someone controls the distribution of yeah and i think part of the reason that gets to be such a weirdly fierce debate is I think has to do with people attacking Marx like Piketty does and that I think the opinion for a very long time especially in the West has been if you can find one thing wrong with Marx obviously everything he said then is wrong which is obviously nonsense mm -hmm. but that's exactly I think where issues like this become so important to people and so hotly debated no I think I think you're right, where the, the idea is, if I can disprove the falling rate of profit theory, that disproves all of Marx. And, and the I think probably the sad part is it seems like many Marxists have also agreed to those terms of the argument. Yeah. That, no, I must defend the falling rate of profit theory, because if... I can't defend that, then all of Marx is wrong, which I don't think is the correct way to look at it at all. I mean, people, for example, um, one of the things that Mark, one of the claims Marx makes in Capital 
is that there will always be um, a commodity tied to money. That there will always be, you know, like gold or silver to back up money. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. That's widely acknowledged is not the case. That's not really an argument. We all know that that's not true. Well, you know, the fact that nobody gets everything right, especially if you're venturing into brand new territory, if you're forging ahead um, to make bold new claims that other people haven't made, it's just, there's going to be some stuff that you get wrong. There's just no two ways about it. You know, like, um, th this might make me really unpopular too, but I'm going to say this, which is that uh, Sigmund Freud, when he started thinking about the human mind and how it worked, yeah, he got a lot of stuff wrong. And it's very popular today to talk about how much stuff Freud got wrong. The fact of the matter is, though, that before Freud, people thought that um, everyone all consciously understood why they did everything. The idea that you might not know why you did something or that there might be motivations in you that you're not aware of, that didn't exist before Freud. And so, like, that's a major, that's just a major contribution to the idea of psychology. And the fact that some things were wrong do doesn't detract for me from the f from the contributions that were correct or or that maybe not weren't in even entirely correct but have opened up the door to new inquiries and new understandings and have really late opened the the gates to a whole new field of inquiry yeah i i like to look at um with marx how marx sort of liked to look at himself and he looked at himself as trying to be scientifically rigorous about it and i think if you look at marx like that it's wonderful if he makes mistakes because that's i mean okay maybe not like wonderful but mm -hmm. you know it's fine i mean that's what science is it's you have theories you do data you try and match the the you know figure out why this data is occurring yeah and you postulate things and it's not always wrong and then people come after you and look at it and say oh well you're wrong here and the theories get refined and, you yeah. know, and Marx also, too, I think is an interesting case because I think, I think Marx got a lot more right than he did wrong. Um, if you look at like capital, mm -hmm. I think, you know, yeah, obviously he got stumped stuff, stuff wrong, like you're saying with uh, tying, uh, commodity to, uh, currency. But overall, I mean, I, there's especially this, these days, if you read Capital Volume One, you will notice a lot of a lot of parallels. Like I was just reading in David Harvey's book where he's talking about theories of rent and stuff about how, well, you know, of course, you know, if there's over speculation, that's going to cause massive devaluation, possibly a crisis. He's writing this in you know seventy eight or seventy nine or something like that. And, you know, housing market. You know, that's yeah. Just going off of what Mark said, um, what is he building off of? So I think I forgot where I was going with that. But. No, no, I yeah, I think you're right. I I may have emphasized too strongly the parts where that that you know it's pointing out that Marx didn't get everything right, but yeah, it is interesting when you crack open. The Communist Manifesto, or about half or, of that's or wrong. Capital, <laughs> um, but it is interesting to read Marx, and sometimes you need to change the language. You know, Marx will say the world global market, but if you <laughs> replace that with globalization, yeah. it's like a newspaper headline from today. Yeah, you know, it it it's certain parts of it are extremely contemporary. Yeah, which is very interesting for for a text that's 150 years old. Yeah, I think, yeah, the important thing with that stuff is to just be, try and be non-dogmatic about it. Like, even yeah. me getting upset at, at Piketty um, bashing Marx is kind of silly because I shouldn't get so upset about that because even if Piketty was right, which in this case he was not right about that, it, whatever, you know, it, it doesn't, like... Mm -hmm destroy everything.
yeah. else that Mark said. Um. So the summaries of Picardy's work that I've read have said that the main argument he makes is that if the rate of return on capital is greater than the rate of growth, that inequality increases. Yeah. Is that yeah. essentially what you, you got from it? Yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, as long as the people making money make more than a things grow, they make more money. Which, you know, it's... He talks also a lot about exponential growth, which is one of those things that does always throw people off. Like, I was just reading something about folding paper. Because, um, you know, the most supposedly you can fold a piece of paper in half is like seven or eight times. I think the world record is 12. Somewhere at about 21, you reach the moon. 103 is the entire visible universe. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. No. Yep. If you fold one piece of paper in half 103 times, you will have a standard sheet of paper. You will get it to the width of the entire universe that we can see. 103? 103. 103. That's not even that. I mean, I could sit down and count to 103 relatively quickly. Right, but we're talking about exponential growth. So it's not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It's 1, 2... Four, so, okay, hold 16. On. We're talking about essentially like a value to the power of something, right? Oh, no, to a power of two. Yeah, Some... if you want to do it a square. So, wait, is it 132 to the power of two? Yeah, if you just do it two. Two to the power 100... of 132? Um, no, that can't be right. Maybe we'll have to put up, there is a, a video, a YouTube video done by, I don't remember who. We'll have to find it and put the link up to it. Two to the hundred and three. Oh yeah, there's an E thirty one, so So it's one it's, it's, point well one, one with, with thirty one zeros. zeros behind it. Yeah, that's a pretty big number. <laughs> yeah, it's Alright, I I'll believe you. I'll believe you. But yeah, and that's a lot of what he's worried about is it's it's that character with when you have such a large fortune that it grows so much faster than everything else. Mm -hmm. And that's where the concentration of wealth is worried about. And that's it, and the simple way to look at this, if I can, I, I'm sorry for all the math today, but the simple way to look at it is if one person has a dollar and another person has a hundred dollars. There's a $99 gap between those two people. But if you double both of them, this person has $2, and this person now has $200, there's a $198 gap. So, like, with exponential growth, even if that's, just, that's equally distributed growth, which we're not really getting right now, but even with equally distributed growth, you you have a growing gap. Yeah. And that just gets worse. Yeah. I suppose if you express the gap as a a like ra as a ratio, that doesn't change it. Assuming that the the growth of weight that would have to in require that the growth of wages and salaries keep up with the growth of capital. Which isn't always the case either. Though. No, that's not even. I wouldn't say that's the case. Um, I'd say that's an exception to the case. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's what the same thing Piketty's getting at. I'm not sure. Yeah. So he spends a lot of time to say that because that is the main thrust of his book. And by the yeah. main thrust, I mean that's about all he's talking about. So it's not a deep analysis of capitalism, or capital, or circulations, just of wealth and mm -hmm. inequality. Yeah. And that's a lot of pages to say that. Yeah. However, the last bit of the book, he tries to offer some solutions, which I uh, thought was maybe the most interesting part of the book, because I didn't disagree with any of his solutions. I actually wrote those down. Yeah, let's hear some of them. So, he had... 
basically sort of four solutions that I pulled out of there. And one was um, an increased social state. So, you know, public education, all the way through college, mm-hmm. public health care, public retirement plans. Just taking care of people was one of them because it's pretty easy to show that if you have healthy, educated population, you will have a good workforce and your GDP will be higher. Mm -hmm. And that's not terribly controversial. Well, that shouldn't be terribly controversial. (laughs) Right. Um, The other part, which I uh, agreed with, was talking about a more heavily uh, gradated, uh, heavily progressive uh, tax system. He was speaking specifically about the United States, so I pulled a few of the numbers. He was talking about an 80% tax on incomes over half a million or a million dollars a year, and 50 to 60% on incomes above $200,000 a year. Well, that's not even... That's not something that hasn't been done before. No, no, that's not something. That's just getting back to, like, the 50s and 60s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... Actually, it's even less than in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, wasn't the top marginal tax rate, like, 94% yeah. or something ridiculous like that? Yeah, like, it was really, really high Yeah. at one point in time. So he's not even proposing something that the U.S., even the United States, has not done before. Yeah. Now, this other one is... Or maybe I'll do this one for last. Uh, so reducing public death debt through this progressive taxation rather than austerity. Again, something that should be pretty obvious and non-controversial, but is. Mm-hmm. And then the last one, and most interesting one, is a progressive tax on a person's net wealth. Ah, yeah. And he's talking about... um, not a high tax. Like, 1, 2, 3 percent on, like, you know, over $10 million or something like that. Now, yeah, that's very interesting. Because depending on what rate you put it at, like, that could be a mechanism for creating more equality. Because there's a, I think there's an argument to be made that, either, like, when, when, um, if you talk to people that, look, this is gonna get, this is gonna sound a little bit off topic. I'm gonna bring it back, though. When y- you talk to people that are real pro capitalist right wingers, some of them, or at least a subsection of them, will will say that they don't like corporations because corporations are collectivist in the sense that if they're publicly traded, it's not just one person that owns that corporation, it's a group of people. And Mar- then there are certain writings of Marx, I, can't, I don't know if they're in the Grundrisse or where they are right now, but that reference joint stock companies, which was the old name for, for publicly traded corporations, joint stock companies as, as a possible path for uh, equalizing things, because it's a way of, of having multiple owners. Capital. Volume 1, I believe. It's in Volume 1? I believe so, yeah. Jeez. I should have known that. But anyway, that that's very interesting. So that, that extreme right-wingers, it's probably the right-wingers that know enough about Marx that they know that he said that and hate everything that he... but don't know enough to distinguish between liking and hating anything that he said. But anyway, <laughs> it, it's... that That's the whole whole stance. But the problem, the thing that, you know, that if you're a Mar- Marxist and you're looking at this, the first thing you notice is, oh, these are extremely not, like, unevenly distributed. Like, the vast majority of stock ownership is held by a very small minority. It's like, I think 1% of the, of the stock owners own 80% of the stocks, something like that. So the, this this ownership is extremely heavily concentrated. So it's a mechanism that could do it if it was more evenly distributed. 
So that the so we're we we've got you know only a part of a solution there. As long as it remains heavily concentrated, it's not a solution. However, the with a tax on wealth, that can start leveling wealth out. So I I think this is actually very interesting. Now here's the thing: if the tax on wealth is lower than the rate of return on wealth, wealth will still grow. Right, so if you if your tax is one percent, but the return on that wealth is three percent, your wealth will grow two percent every year. And I guess you'd also have to figure in inflation because if inflation was greater than you know, I guess your wealth is probably growing greater than three percent. But whatever, you know what I you get the idea that um, with taking inflation into account, you, the the growth needs to be greater than the the rate of taxation, and it will still grow. But if that tax were high enough at the at the highest levels, it could be a way to slowly start bringing that down and and evening things out. Because if people, if stock ownership were more evenly distributed, you'd be getting on towards having the people that produce the surplus also control it by by means of stock ownership, which might not be the best mechanism, but it, it's a way to start approaching that goal. So I I think that that is very interesting, but it you know I think s- starting down that path is is a good idea, but it's it, you know depending on the rate, you know the rate could be. You know, maybe when it is first introduced, the rate will be, you know, 0.0005% or something. And that, you know, it would would be good, but, you know, wouldn't be, you know, a means to create a different society. So, you know, it'd be, uh, it's, it's that old saying that a quantitative difference eventually can lead to a qualitative difference. <laughs> Which, which is one of the things that people will bring up when they're trying to explain dialectics to you. I think that's what we're looking at with that, with that particular method of taxation. Yeah. Well, and I think another thing to mention about Piketty, or Piketty, oh boy, I've already slept, (laughs) (laughs) is that I think Time Magazine called it soft Marxism or something like that. Uh. And I need to stress that Piketty doesn't know Marx. He's not a Marxist. I saw something that said, actually, it might even be in that paper. I think they had a footnote that said, he in an interview said he's never read Capital, even though he's making reference to it. Here's a good way to know he's not a Marxist. That's kind of a shame. I mean, I try to be pretty open-minded about most things, but, I mean, if your book is going to take the name of a previous book with, like, an extra little tagline... It's probably good if you've read that book. Yeah. And he's an economist, so I think you'd have the background to understand it. Yeah, to like, yeah. Especially if it's like your field of study. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, if I, if, if, if an English professor wrote a book called Romeo and Juliet in the 21st century, but never bothered to read Romeo and Juliet, that would that could potentially be an issue. That would be a thing, especially if they just based it off like the Leonardo DiCaprio movie of it from the, I want to say late nineties, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but there's not there's not even like a movie of Capital that you could watch. I don't know. Some no, probably yeah. maybe someone will respond with like a really like unknown I, documentary that like was made on the cheap. But in yeah. I'd love a documentary about that, capital. That'd be awesome. That'd be fun. Yeah. If if anyone knows of one, please tweet us and let us know. Also, here's how you can another way you can tell he is not a Marxist in that his global progressive tax on wealth, which as you just pointed out, could very well be used um uh to help diminish them, is he specifically lays out two goals of what it would do. And it's simply to stop the indefinite increase of the inequality of wealth. So it's not even to get rid of the inequality. It's just to stop the indefinite spread. 
Um, and two, and this one I think uh, is just nonsense. I don't think this would work at all. Impose effective regulation on the financial and banking systems in order to avoid crisis. Although, going along with this, I should also say, to make that one seem not quite as ridiculous, is that he says in order for this sort of attacks on wealth to work, you need international cooperation with all financial institutions actually sharing data so that you can know how much wealth someone has. Mm -hmm. But I still could not see how that would magically avoid crises. That sounds nonsensical. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 we talked earlier about falling rate of profit theory, and this crisis theory, I think, is another one of those things where you don't necessarily need it to be a Marxist, but Marxists are really into it. And uh, unlike the falling rate of profit theory, I think there's a lot to, you know, I've, I've actually, you know, this is something that catches my interest, and, you know, I think... There's many crisis theories out there, and I don't think any one of them is a single bullet in and of itself. But I think, to uh, just in a very general way, I think the general way to say it is, there are contradictions of capitalism out there that cause capital to go into crisis from time to time. Oh, yeah. And simply having good banking regulation is not going to solve the root issue. No, because the root issue is capitalism itself. Which, and this brings up something that annoys me about Piketty's book getting such wide acceptance in the United States, and that is people like his solutions, which, I mean, I have no problem with any of those things. However, I think that exactly what you just said, none of them they don't solve the problem. They might be tools in the direction of solving the problem or a step along the way of solving the actual problem, but they don't, and people latch on to them like, this is the solution. Do these few things, and bam, capitalism works for everyone, and things will be good. <laughs> and I think that's why Piketty sees himself as the next Keynes, because mm -hmm. I think that's very much how Keynes was treated. And oh, yeah. for a decent amount of time, Keynesianism worked pretty effectively until you had, you know, the 70s and the crises of uh, Keynesianism with hyperinflation. It's something that I'm always repeating to liberal friends of mine, is that capitalism is fundamentally a system of inequality, and you will never get a just, fair, and equal society while you allow the fundamental system to remain. It's not possible. It just yeah, it doesn't work. And that is something that people are really loath to accept, I think. Yep. That and with Thatcher's assertion that there are no alternatives, I think between the two, yep. I think people really want to believe that there aren't any alternatives. I don't know why. Oh, Probably yeah. because it's easy. You know, if we, we, we'll have to get Justin on the podcast sometime because I think he is a really good, like almost a case study in there is no alternative because I, you can talk to him about Marxist theory for hours on end and he really won't disagree with with anything fundamental like he'll like have maybe disagreements sort of like you and i will have disagreements but he'll basically you know in many ways i think he's basically a marxist because the way he interprets the world and the way he uh, kind of analyzes things very from very much similar to a marxist point of view very marxist in its take however he sees no future of any kind. Uh, he he doesn't believe that capitalism can go on forever. He believes that capitalism is doomed to fail at some point, which is a very Marxist thing to believe. But he believes at that point in time, what will happen is basically the apocalypse. Like, society will collapse, and, and things will just be awful, and then we'll build from the ground up again. Yeah, it's the uh, the famous, it's easier for people to imagine the end of the world than it is for people to imagine a change in economic systems. Mm -hmm. Which is especially weird considering historically there have been a lot of changes in economic systems. But yeah, 
I think you're right in that we should definitely save that f- more on that for when he's around and we can have a good conversation with him about that. Yep. Okay. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to say about Piketty and his book? Uh, Do you recommend it? I I don't know. It depends on why you want to read it. If you think it has the answers, don't read it. It doesn't. Um, read a review. Um, well, I guess maybe be careful with a review. You read, read a Marxist review of it. That is what I would recommend. <laughs> David Harvey has a nice uh, review uh, amongst many, many, many others on the left. I personally made myself read it because I'm going into economics. Mm. And if it doesn't come up, I will be surprised since it's, you know, was a number one bestseller for I don't know how many weeks. Yeah, that's when was the weird. last time an economics book was a yeah. number one bestseller? A 600 page, <clears throat> excuse me, a 600 page economics book. Yeah. Number one. Yeah, it's. Well, that's, that's not really out. Uh, the like, economics books are. At least 600 pages. Well, I'm just saying, you know, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, I don't think is 600 pages. Oh, well, okay, yeah. <laughs> you know. Okay. It's, it's long, it's, not only is it an economics book, but it's a long economics book. I mean, that yeah. is not, yeah, that is and, not a little bit for people to choke down. Yep, because now that I think about it, I bet the last economics book that was a bestseller was probably Freakonomics. Oh, yeah. And I bet you Freakonomics is like 250 pages or something. I had to guess. I don't know. I'm trying to remember because I worked yesterday and, of course, I saw a copy of it go past me uh, being returned. I would probably put it somewhere about 300. Okay. Three to 350. It is not nearly as long. Significantly less long than 600 pages. Yeah. Plus with that one, there's a documentary. So you could just watch that too. There you go. Although... Give it another year, and there'll be a documentary about this, I suppose. Maybe? I don't know. Can, do you see that happening? I only see it happening because people are inexplicably really excited about this. Really? See, this is my problem. I live under a rock. I don't watch enough, like, media or anything. Like, who... Where would I see buzz about this book? Uh, and it's died off a little bit now since it's been a little bit since it's come out. But, like, Elizabeth Warren is surprisingly a big fan of this. I say surprisingly because I normally think she's a pretty smart lady who's a very, has a very keen sense and is pretty wise about things. And I mean, I guess she's not, she's a, you know, happy to live in a capitalist world. So I guess maybe it isn't that surprising that she likes it. But yeah, otherwise, I don't know. I for weeks and weeks and weeks, that's all I, I'd seen that all over all sorts of different news sites. I'm trying to think, I if I look at the Huffington Post occasionally because that's a decent news aggregate site, and I for weeks it was in the top th- threads that they had. See, I listen to public radio, and I remember when um, when Freakonomics came out. There were they had the authors on public radio and they they even have a show I think now where they do it like they have a freak- podcast ah okay yeah see I've not seen that same buzz about Piketty uh, and maybe it's just because he's hard to get a hold of like he I think he he's a French guy so he's yeah. probably on a schedule that's not conducive to him being on radio here in the U S I've definitely seen a lot I know. That there are a lot of, there must be a lot of buzz because when I I got the my copy of the book through the public library, surprise, surprise, mm-hmm. and there were over four hundred holds on it, which is a lot. Yeah, like you mean new popular movies get that many holds on them? What what's like the most amount of holds? Like what? How how big is the longest hold or one of the longest holds? Um. Uh, about a thousand, a little over. Oh, okay. Wow, yeah, so 400 is is really pretty significant, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think 50 Shades of Grey, when that was inexplicably popular, talking about inexplicably popular books, I think that one topped a thousand at some point. Wow, so to and that's have a- an economics book at 400, actually, yeah, that that's actually mind-blowing to me. I would have never guessed that this book could have gotten half or whatever, like even a third or a quarter as many holds as as Fifty Shades of Grey. And that's, you know, and that's as many 
just at a certain time based upon the amount of books. I don't know what the total, total amount is. Oh. Because, I mean... At, because if you have more copies of it, that divides it out It goes faster, more. yeah. Because initially... Oh, uh, okay. They had to do a second printing of this book because they did not anticipate it doing as well as it did. Mm-hmm. So initially there were, I think, a half dozen copies in the system. Mm-hmm. And now I think they're both... Somewhere between 30 and 50. I haven't counted. Okay. But the amount of holds is still somewhere in the 300s. Okay. So, it's definitely... it's People are definitely interested. So. Yeah. Okay, well that was a great review. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. And if you have any questions that you'd like to send to us about uh, Picardy, his book, or, or anything else, really, you can contact us on Twitter. Best way to reach us is uh sending you can send um me a message i am at red wagner 2 r e d w a g n e r number 2 and i am at schmidt a j s c h m i t t a j if you and yeah if you send us a question or a comment we may respond to it on the program so please let us let us know what you're thinking and what um, questions or comments you have. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.